Okay, just a quick check. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Awesome. Yes. All right, give me one more second to finish setting up and then we can begin. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yes. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, anyone who decides to join in afterwards will just be able to hear the message afterwards. Uh, so really quickly, this is Chem 114. Uh, my name is Jay Ho. I will be your instructor for the lecture course. Uh, our class time is 4.40 to 6.30. Uh, I will try to get here earlier starting next week. So if you guys have any questions, you can always drop in early and ask, okay? And our office hours are always right after lecture. So generally right after lecture, I uh, close out the Zoom program, then I reopen it afterwards. For anyone who happens to be away from their keyboard, they can just go ahead and re-sign back on if they want to attend the office hours. Any questions so far? Yes, yeah, some of us are taking Biology 106 at 6.30 right afterwards. So that may not work if we need to meet with you. Would it be possible to email you and work at another time? Yes, uh, ideally probably beforehand. Yeah. So ideally on Tuesday in general. So if you want to meet after biology, we can do that too. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, uh, so going through, you're either in the Tuesday class or the Friday class. You're, in, you're always in the Tuesday lecture, but you're either in the Tuesday recitation or Friday recitation. Anyone have any questions on that? Okay, I'm assuming everyone here has at least attended their very first recitation. Okay. Uh, things you will need, you will need a scientific non-graphing calculator. Uh, there, there are some online, since most of this course is online, uh, make do with whatever you have, okay? The textbook we're going to work with is the ninth edition Superberg, and that should be already be included in your ebook. Any questions before we continue? Excuse me, Professor, there's a dinging in the back, and I don't know what it is. Oh, the, the sound in the background is as people are joining in. So I keep that there just in case I miss anyone. So let's say someone joins in and I'm talking and I don't realize it. So this way I can see it and I can admit them in. So it's only gonna happen in the beginning as long as people are joining in at the start. Now, what I also plan on doing is I'm gonna be asking one person or two people to be co-hosts eventually, and they will go ahead and just admit people in for me. But we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, any questions? Um, professor, I have a question. Sure. Um, so last semester I bought Alex for two semesters and this mm -hmm. time um, when I go to Alex, it's, it gives me an option to extend the access and I, when I click it, it says access, you need an access code from your um, professor and if you don't have it, just get back to them. How do I get it? Uh, so the access code will be shown right here. So just give me a second and we'll go through it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So a little bit about our grading policy. Oh, I misclicked. Give me one second. So our grading policy here, you can find the exact details of grading policies right here on the grading scale on this link here. This is the QC grading scale. So I believe it was a 73 is a C and then onwards, upwards and stuff like that. Uh, how we break down the grades, 20% of this is a reading assignment, which is one type of homework. This is your connect homework. This is due 40 minutes before class. So we're gonna cover chapter 12 today and also chapter 12 next week. So by the time we meet tomorrow, uh, next week, at about four o'clock, so 40 minutes before class, you must finish that first homework. If you understand this, please acknowledge it. Give me some kind of reply. Okay. All right. So there's essentially nine different chapters. This is mostly just reading. It's very simple stuff. You just answer the questions. They give you the same questions over again. So if you get it wrong, you can do it again. So it's not a stressful one, but it's to get you to read the material beforehand. So how this course works is, Ideally, you wanna read the chapter before we finish the lecture. So by the time I finish chapter 12, you should have finished reading chapter 12. So it should be a review for you when we come to lecture. Okay, your Alex homework, this is gonna be a very large portion of your grade as well, 20%. So 40% of your entire grade is based on just homework, 20% from Alex, 20% from Connect. So the, the Alex homework here is a little bit more complicated. It actually treats it more like a smart program. So kind of like Netflix, kind of like Amazon. It, it looks at your preferences and looks at your skills. So it's going to test you on concept and math skills. So if you're lacking in any of those categories, it's going to give you more questions. So some students may end up with 20 questions if they do all the questions correct. 
If they get questions wrong, it's gonna give them more questions. Some students can end up with 200 questions. So it depends on how you answer the questions, make sure you take your time with it, okay? Now, ideally, whenever you see this thing called post-objective progress assessment, it's kind of like an assessment to see how well you know so how what you know so far. It's gonna come up every two chapters. Don't click the I don't know button unless you really have no idea what's going on. Okay, it's gonna send you back and then you're gonna to have to redo those practice questions again. Any questions so far? Yes. But, uh, go ahead. No, you can go. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Hey, um I was just going to ask a question about the connect because when I registered for it, I put the access code and everything mm -hmm. and there was no reading that popped up. It says it was just an empty page. Okay. So we're going to have to take a look at that afterwards. Uh, did you click the link? Uh, we're going to look through it in a second, but there is a link that you have to click on to register in the first place in order to put in your access code. Yeah, I did. Class the link. I did that. Okay. Um, if you want stay after class, we'll take a look at that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving onwards, there will be occasional open pie periods, which means you can work on other chapters, but you won't be able to work, you can work on these, but you won't get credit for them on stuff that's already been due. So I grade based on objectives. So every objective that you complete by the deadline, that's the grade you get. So let's say chapter 12 is due not next week, but the week after. Uh, it's gonna be due at 12 o'clock at night on Tuesday. So if you complete it, you get 100% on it, you get the 100%. Okay, the next one here is quizzes. This is 35% of your grade. We have about eight quizzes that you're gonna take. I drop one of your lowest quiz grades. So I don't need a reason why you, you have the lowest quiz grade. You can end up choosing not to take one quiz, although I advise you to take all the quizzes. So that lowest quiz, whether you choose to take it or not, is automatically dropped. Any questions so far? Yes, I have a yep. question about the connect again. Um, so it says we have one attempt. Does that mean once we start, we have to finish it within a certain hour? Uh, no, you just have to finish it by that deadline. So the deadline is next week at 4 p.m. So I could start right now. You well, start after, right now. You well, can take your time. Class. You could you could choose to rush it in the last like hour before class begins next week. Okay. Whatever you choose to do. As long Thank as you, you get it done, you get the credit for it. Um, quick question uh, regarding the ALEC, um, the assessments that we're going to get after every two chapters, is it going to be accounted for a grade or just like an assessment for ourselves? Uh, it's a mixture of the two. So it will send you back if you're, if, let's say you don't know something like a core concept, it's going to send you back to redo those questions and you won't be able to move forward until you finish those questions. So directly affecting your grade, it will not affect it, but in order to move forward, you need to finish those. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, once again, lowest quiz grade is dropped. I don't need to know a reason why. It's just simply whatever is your lowest. If it's a zero, that's the one that gets dropped. Okay. And you don't have to tell me why. Whatever it is, just you're having a bad day. This is what it is. Your final exam is the only thing we are taking in person. So normally this class would have been three exams and a final, and you would have taken all of those in person. But because I have eight different quizzes, I've spoken with the chair and he's agreed that we're just gonna keep everything online except for the final exam. So that's the only thing you're gonna come in for. I'm gonna check with them on what day that is. I believe it's either the 14th or the 21st of December. So once I get a confirmation of which day, then we're gonna schedule it for that day, okay? And this is worth 20% of your grade. And this is uh, not 50 questions, multiple choice. It's probably like 70 questions, multiple choice but more than likely it's gonna be purely multiple choice. So ACS format. Okay. Now 5%, I call this participation. This just simply means that you come to lecture, you go to recitation. So on Zoom here, I automatically have your attendance taken. So you don't have to say anything when you join it. The fact that you join in, it tells me how long you've been in. Um, if you join at the beginning, if you join at the end, whatever it is, okay? So it automatically takes your attendance. So as long as you're joining in, and you're participating, answering questions. There is also a poll that I will be sending out later. So that's gonna happen in almost every lecture. As long as you're answering questions in the polls and you get majority of it correct, there should be no issues, okay? And this also includes in your recitation. So you must attend your recitation classes. Uh, they also take attendance there. Anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Uh, how many questions on the quizzes? It varies, Cindy. I'm just answering your question. 
uh, depends on the quiz. So some questions will have more multiple choice, some will have more short answers, some calculations, because every chapter is a little bit different. All right. Uh, but before I forget, quizzes are 45 minutes. So that's how much time you have. That's going to be at the end of your recitation. It's already scheduled out. So you have the last 45 minutes to finish that quiz. Okay. So a little bit about our schedule. Um, obviously, I went into very big detail here. You know exactly what topic we're covering on every day that we're, we have class. Okay. So today we're going to do some introduction. We're going to start chapter 12. More than likely, we can finish almost all of chapter 12 today. Next week, we're going to be finishing chapter 12 and starting chapter 13. So based on this schedule here, I can promise you one thing. I will never fall behind this schedule. More than likely, I might be a little bit ahead of the schedule. So ideally, when it comes time to learn about chapter 13, you should have already read that chapter. Any questions? Okay, and on the right side here, this is where your Connect homework is due. Chapter 12 is due next week by four o'clock, so 40 minutes before class. And your Alex homework is due that the week after that. So right after we finish chapter 12 here, one week later, by 12 o'clock at night or 11.59 at night, you should have finished your Alex homework. Any questions? Okay. So I strongly recommend getting a head start on your Alex homework. That is going to take you some time. Uh, I have a question. Um, it, on, on, for the due date, it says uh, not 9 four. Teen, that's not that's not next week uh which one are we talking about alex or connect right now um to connect connect yeah connect is due next week so not next week sorry two weeks from now two weeks the next time we meet uh -huh. got it yeah i forgot that next week we are off okay so once again it's not next week it's the 14th but i strongly recommend getting started now okay um, so all of this is right here for you. Once again, the last two sessions here is mostly going to be review for our final exam. This is going to be in person. I'm trying to find out if it's going to be the 14th or the 21st, one of those two days. And if you haven't done so yet, uh, yes, next Tuesday, you're off. I believe it is a mixture of Labor Day and the Jewish holidays. So six, seven, and eight, most people are off. I don't know if, about all those days, actually. Let me double check with um, CUNY first, and you should be able to see that, OK? Uh, also, one last thing I want to bring up here. If you haven't done so yet, you can go ahead and register for this course in Zoom. So what that does is I don't have to click the Admit button for you to join it. Once I start the program, you should have full access to it. You should be able to join in right away. So I strongly recommend doing that. That saves you the trouble of waiting for me to admit you into the room. And if you happen to have trouble doing that, then you can just manually join as most of you have done. Anyone have any questions? Okay. All right. So a little bit about your quiz schedule here, uh, Tuesday section or Friday section, and they tell you what program that your instructor uses. Uh, instructor Aziz also uses Zoom and instructor Look likes to use Blackboard Collaborate. So you're gonna join him on Blackboard Collaborate for your recitation classes. Uh, it tells you what days you have recitation, any gaps in between. So like next week, there's obviously no class for Friday and no class. Oh, sorry. This week, there's no class for Friday. And then next week, there's no class for Tuesday. And then the bolder ones are when your quiz is. So you know where every single, you know, essentially every single day that you have something due. You know when your quizzes are due, you know when your homeworks are due. Anyone have any questions? Yes, I do, Professor. Yep, go ahead. Um, so the two sections, um, they're both recitations. Um, do you have like do you have to go to both of them or just one of them? You're only scheduled for one of them. So on your CUNY first, you should see that you're automatically in the Tuesday lecture and either the Tuesday recitation or the Friday recitation. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so double check which one you're in. Uh, which one did you attend? Which um, recitation did you attend so far? So I uh, attended today's recitation Tuesdays. Okay, and you're scheduled for today's, right? I believe so. I just want to clarify. Yeah, so then you just keep attending Tuesdays. Um, Professor, I have a question about the quizzes. 
Sure. So the problem is that on the 21st and the 28th, I yeah, will actually, that's something that I do want to talk about. I noticed that um, some students were emailing me that I know if you have a holiday schedule for that day, go ahead and send me an email and we will go ahead and coordinate a day in that week for you to take the quiz. Could we just take it on Friday with Professor Look? Uh, I, you wouldn't be able to join his um, class to talk about the, um, so he's going to have recitation first, then he's going to meet, but then you wouldn't be able to join his Blackboard Collaborate. So that's the only issue. Okay. So, so essentially you would be missing recitation that day, but I would give you the password we would contact and schedule on a day and time that's convenient for everyone that needs that time. And then you will take it at that time that I designate. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, once again, the bolded ones, yes, the quizzes will be on Blackboard. They will complete, be completely online. The bolded ones are the days of your quizzes. As you can tell right here, I tried to space it out where you had two quizzes back to back and then you had a week off. Uh, I couldn't do it here just because of the timing. And this is very important right here. If you look carefully at these days, chapter 20 is split between two different weeks. So for this week right here, Friday is taking it first and then Tuesday is taking it. Any questions so far? 45 minutes. Okay, someone raise their hand. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm sorry if you mentioned it already, but um, the quizzes are in class, right? No, quizzes are online. Online, okay, oh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, to answer your question, number of questions, again, is based off of each type of quiz. So some quizzes are more conceptual, so you probably have more multiple choice. Some quizzes are more mathematical, so you have calculation problems, more calculation problems. So it varies depending on the chapter. And they are at the end of recitation. Uh, so a little bit about the quizzes. There is no backtracking. You get displayed, you get one question displayed to you at a time. And you cannot close out the program. So you start the quiz, you finish it there. Okay, any other questions? Um, professor, I remember last semester um, with our chemistry course, that was one of the problems and like many students were complaining about it that we were not allowed to backtrack. So can you, like, is there any chance you can change that? Nope, I'm keeping time? it the same way. Um, if you run into an issue, like an, a program issue, then you just send me an email and I will resolve by the end of that day. Okay. okay? So that's something that I can always promise you. If you had a technical issue, Take a picture of it as proof as well, just, just for your records. Uh, send me an email right there. I can actually check through Blackboard itself to see how many questions you started, what happens along the way. So that's something that I can check along the way as well. So if there's an issue in that sense, I can go ahead, re-enable it for later in the day if that's the case. But ideally, it's going to be no backtracking, one question at a time. I did not say how many questions there were because it di it's different depending on the chapter. So there may be some chapters where I give you two multiple choice and one long calculation problem. Some may be like four or five long calculation problems. It varies depending on the chapter. Well, Professor, how many chapter in final exam? The final exam is going to include chapters 12, 13, 16, and 24 are combined together, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. So eight chapters, essentially. If you really want to count 16 and 24 separately, nine chapters. Thank you. Okay, uh, just a little more detail for those that want to read more into it. Um, the quiz dates are scheduled. So if you look carefully at this list right here, depending if you're in the Tuesday or Friday section, you know the exact day you are taking the quiz. So if you need a reminder, refer back to the syllabus. Everything is listed here. Uh, you do not need to know chapters 1 to 11. So chapter 12 is something you do need to know. But chapter 1 to 11, you do not need to know directly. But for example, we're going to learn about intermolecular forces today. You do need to know some things about bonding from chapters 1 to 11. So you may have to refer back to stuff that from Chem 1. All right. So right here, we have a course breakdown. When you see this little star right here, what this means is I am not going to go into detail about that chapter. So 12.6 is about solids. We're literally going to talk about maybe two, three slides about solids, and that's it. So the very, very beginning introduction, just an overview of it, and then we're going to move forward. So that's not going to be on your quizzes, but 
it may be on your final exam. So you are still expected to know it, but at that moment, you don't need to know it and rush for the quiz. And once again, that's only when you see the star. Okay, so a little bit about how to access things. Uh, for your Connect, if you're in the Tuesday rest station, you can buy from the QC online bookstore. It's an ebook with an access to the, um, so with access to your Alex and your Connect. So I don't post the PowerPoints that you will see here, right? But I do post a simplified version of the PowerPoint. So it's kind of like just some information here and there, none of the practice problems. So part of the reason why is because I need you to follow along with me as we're going through it, because there's some things that you wouldn't understand as I'm explaining it if I, if I wasn't explaining. It. And also I want you to use the textbook more so than the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is kind of like, I would say the skeleton structure. The, the book itself is the entire body. So you want to go ahead and look at the textbook first. Plus you paid for it. That's the link that you were talking about that we had to click when we were doing the connect thing. This is the link for the connect right here. Yeah, that's what I clicked on. And that's why I was telling you I'm having problems because it says that there's not, no book in there when I put the access code and everything. Okay, so I'll take a look at this again with you after class. Professor? Yep. I had a quick question for Connect as well. So I bought Alex last semester for Chem 1, and I got the two-semester access, but we'd never used Connect last semester. So do I have to rebuy, like, Alex? Uh, so here's the thing. You bought a two-semester access, right? Yeah. So you should have one semester still available no matter what, right, for mm -hmm. a Connect and for Alex. Uh, we never used Connect last semester. Is that a separate code or the same code? Uh, it should. So when you buy it, what the bookstore sends is probably two codes, one for Alex and one for Connect. Okay, so I should just go back to the original email. And yes. That right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, also, to let you know, if the bookstore is taking a while, generally speaking, you get two weeks of free access immediately. So the second you signed up for everything, you automatically get two weeks of courtesy access. So if you look down here, there is a financial aid code that automatically gives you two weeks of Connect. The second, oh, sorry, of Alex. And then the second you sign up for Connect here, it automatically gives you two weeks. Now, obviously, I, I recommend if you haven't done so yet, by the end of today, you should go ahead and order the stuff from the bookstore. And the reason why is because I see some of you are mentioning it. It takes a while for the bookstore to send you a code. I actually spoke with someone today. Um, I sent them a picture of my screen because I also had the Alex code from last semester and, and it's expiring. So call them up and see if how they can help you. If someone had purchased a two uh, semester plan for Alex and it's not working. Okay. Uh, I don't, so what I want you to do right now is not buy anything directly from Connect or Alex. The reason why is because if you buy either one of those, you're just getting just that code for like $99 or more, which is ridiculous. Because if you look at the price here, $70 you get for both, you get both. That's because we made a deal with McGraw-Hill. So we have a link just from Queens College with them. So you get both of them for $70, as opposed to getting one individually for $100. Uh, okay, let's continue then. So if you need to access the Alex code, it's right here. You go ahead and plug that in. Uh, you should have access to the class. If you're having trouble with Connect, you can stay after class and we can talk about it. If you can't log in, uh, generally speaking, for Connect, if you can't log in, clear your browser history. Uh, you may be able to do go from there. If you can't log in from Alex, create a new account and log in from there and put in the access code that way. Okay. Uh, worst case scenario. Oh, well, actually, one thing I do want to bring up for those of you that mentioned that you've bought the two semester access, please go ahead and check when that expires. If it expires before the end of the semester, and the end of the semester is very much at the end of December, I would go ahead and contact them, see if they can give you an extension on that or whatever the method is, because I don't want you to be starting the course halfway through, you get down to like maybe November and then you can't work on your homework anymore because my due dates are set. Any questions? Uh, how long is it basically professor? Because when I go on my Alex, it just shows me when I bought it for the last time. It doesn't show me an expiration date. Uh, when you start using it, I think it gives you, it depends on what the program is. I don't know if it gives you 10 months or it gives you 12 months. So I would check on the expiration date. If you're not sure about the expiration date, send me an email. I'll check on my end if I can find it. And then we can talk about it. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So some side notes and disclaimer, this is the ending portion of it. All of our lectures will be here on 
Zoom. I will provide, the link is already provided on Blackboard. Uh, you also see it in the syllabus here. Uh, once again, use your full name when you're joining in. This way it saves as your full name. If I see a name, I've had students who joined maybe from their work account or something, and I see names that aren't their names, just something completely different. So I don't know who that is. I don't know how I can give them credit for attendance, things like that. So join with your name, okay? Um, recitations are obviously conducted with your recitation instructor based on the program they choose. Uh, your quizzes will be given at the end of recitation. Your recitation instructor will give you the password for that quiz. And for those that can't make it for those particular days, if we talked about it in advance, I will set up a time and give you a particular password just for that quiz. Okay. And once again, if you can't make it for a quiz, if you tell me in advance, not like the day before, but like right now, then I can adjust and try to accommodate you for that. Usually you take it within that week. Okay. So if you have any questions that are not related to the current topic that we're going over, so let's say we're going over chapter 12, you thought of something from like maybe the previous chapter or the next chapter, uh, save it for the end of class. I want to answer your questions, but just in case of time, I don't want to end up missing out on covering what we have to cover. Okay. Um, we do move at a very fat, rapid pace. How this course works is you get two hours of recitation and two hours of lecture. Normally you get three hours of lecture, one hour of recitation. So you're getting more time in recitation to do more practice problems, go over stuff you don't understand. But essentially in terms of lecture, we're getting less time. So that's why I move out at a very, very fast pace. So you can probably see from like Rate My Professor reviews and other places that I talk really fast and I cover stuff once again at a very, very fast pace. Your uh, Alex and Connect homework, that's 40% of your entire grade. You want to do both. I've had students who decided to do only one and not the other. The highest grade they can get in the class is an 80, as if they get 100% on everything. And I've had students who did neither of the two and then tried doing the quizzes. Even if you got 100% of the quizzes, got 100% of the final, the highest grade you can get is a 60. So you must do your homework in order to pass this class. And you want to buy your Alex and Connect ebook right away. If you're having any financial issues with that, uh, I can try to get in contact with McGraw Hill about it. Uh, more than likely, they don't really do anything but we can talk about it after class, okay? Um, everything in terms of the quizzes, uh, again, connect depends on how you, how you answer the questions. Some people answer questions really quickly. Some people take a while. You have unlimited tries with the questions. So if you get it wrong, you can redo it again. And it gives you the same question, okay? Uh, in terms of quizzes, it's going to be based off of a couple of categories, what your recitation instructor covers, what I cover, uh, what's covered in the lectures, and the homeworks. Both are graded on completion. Yeah, so if you get 97% on one of them and it's by the due date, you get 97% of that grade, and that's it. There's no way to get those 3% back. Once that due date is done, that's it. Okay. So... I will be the one designing the quizzes, but I get input from your recitation instructors. So I highly recommend picking, your, picking the brains of your recitation instructors. More than likely, they'll tell you about a question that might possibly be on the quiz, okay? Uh, I cover all my lectures in, uh, well, not in person, synchronously. So we're always meeting here and I'm always gonna be live. If forever, for whatever reason I am not live, I'll be recording it in advance and I will let you know. And like I said, we do quizzes here instead of tests. It's very strong emphasis on the homework programs. If you would prefer a regular three exam, one final course, those courses are still available. We can transfer you into them if you want to. And my last warning is just that there will be a lot of time focused on this course. So be ready for that. Okay, so my four side knows. So you know when everything is due, you know the exact time that is due, the exact day that is due. So I am not giving any extensions under any circumstances. So your next Connect homework is due next week. To prevent the chance of having a blackout, uh, let's say an emergency at home, start today. Finish it within the next few days. If something does come up, you have it done already. Same thing with your Alex homework. Okay, you know exactly when everything is due, so get that done. There are no makeup quizzes. Quizzes pretty much, if you know you can't make it for a certain time, tell me in advance, we can try to make schedule a time. But once that time is up and I haven't heard anything from you, you haven't emailed me, you haven't contacted me about a quiz, you just didn't take it, 
I assume you're taking that as a zero. And if that's your lowest quiz grade, that's the one that gets dropped. So I don't offer any additional extra credit. There may be one assigned with one of the homeworks, but generally speaking, there is no extra credit, okay? And the last thing is I do not curve in this class. So I've been teaching this class for what, five, six years. Every semester class average is always a C, range between the 73 to 76. Never had to curve, never will curve. And I always hold this true. If everyone in here does all their homework, does great on the quizzes, and you all get A's, I will argue with the department that everyone here deserves an A, okay? I will fight for you in that sense. But at the same time, if everyone here fails the homeworks, fails the quizzes, and everyone gets an F, I will get everyone an F and I will fight the department that everyone deserves an F. Any questions? Okay. So additional information, this was created as a hybrid course originally. So we did have online components originally. So now that it's an online course with the exception of the final exam, still pretty much the same stuff. Nothing's really changed. Uh, office hours are always open after lecture. If you can't make it for that particular time, we can always talk about another time, maybe before class or on another day. Uh, if you don't understand something in the syllabus or even in general in any topic, send me an email and I'll get back to you. Um, I know things are crazy right now. Things are gonna still be crazy, probably even up to the next year. So let me know about anything that comes up, preferably as early as possible, okay? Uh, if there's any kind of calculation error or issues that you notice in the slide, I want you to speak up and let me know. And this is part of us growing as people in general. I'm human, I make mistakes. So sometimes the calculation error, if you notice it, let me know. Do not hesitate to tell me. I want you to get the best grade that you can get, but also the grade that you deserve, okay? And main thing I wanna mention here is that the only person who's gonna fight the hardest for your grade is going to be you. So not your parents, not your grandparents, not someone who's paying for your tuition, not your friends, not your teachers. You yourself are going to be the only person who's going to get yourself the highest grade possible. Okay? All right, so we're going to go ahead and transition over to student guidelines. Uh, I'll go through this really quickly. I mentioned this part already, two-hour lecture, two-hour recitation. Your recitation is an hour and 50 minutes. Generally, what you do in recitation, if it's a regular, um, there's three things that can occur. So you have a regular recitation, you're working out stuff with your uh, recitation instructor. He or she goes over topics that you have, bring questions. If you have any questions at any point, that's where you bring it. That's where you could sit down and spend two hours worth just talking about how to solve A plus B, whatever it might be, okay? Uh, you have quizzes at the end. On any days that there are quizzes, it will be assigned at the end of recitation. You also spend part of that time working on your homework itself. So your recitation instructor will allow you time to work on the Alex or Connect, depending on what you feel comfortable with. And you can ask questions from that. So let's say you don't understand something. Maybe they'll ask you what question it is. You tell them, they look it up. They try to explain how to answer the question. Okay. So two types of days. You have non-quiz days. There's about six of them. Eight of these days are quiz days. Uh, they will have some similarities to Alex questions, but they may be a little bit more challenging. Um, like I mentioned, bring your own question. This is the time where you can go ahead and pick their brains. Ask them anything you need to ask them, okay? Now, your instructors may move ahead into further chapters, especially if your class as a whole feel comfortable with it. Let's say I'm on chapter 13 and you happen to all understand chapter 13 and your recitation instructor says, okay, let's move to chapter 16. Get a head start. So by the time you hear it in my lecture, you already know what's going what's gonna to be expected, okay? Uh, Pretty much everything straightforward here. Quizzes are 45 minutes, uh, no backtracking. If you're having trouble with your connection, my recommendation is pause, don't start, send me an email. I'll give you a delayed time, maybe by like five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you need, right, to start it. So if that's the issue, move to a better connection location, then tell me, and then begin. I don't want you to start and then lose connection, because then it becomes a whole thing, okay? So I will handle all the gradings for your quizzes. Uh, I prefer to try to finish everything within the week. Sometimes I'm not able to because there's some people who have it scheduled for later, whatever the reason is. So give it about a week, at maximum two weeks, and I'll have it all graded, okay? 
So you're going to sometimes see that it marks things wrong. I will always manually go over and double check your answers. Sometimes there's a rounding error. Let's say you put in 24.9 and it says it should be 25. I'll go in and check. It says, okay, they put in 24.9. It should be 25. It counts. So sometimes the program won't recognize it. I will always manually check it, double check it, triple check it. Uh, you cannot go back to backtrack on the quizzes questions. So the question you get is the question you do, then you move to the next one. In terms of slides, I post a modified version of the slides, a short version, kind of like a skeletal version. So you get just some of them, like some of the main points, but you don't go, it doesn't go into detail. All right. Uh, that's pretty much it for all this. Does anyone have any questions before we begin chapter 12? Hi, Professor, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, where is the textbook specifically? Is it on Alex or Connect? Because it's both. not working for both. It's on both. Uh, once you log in, right, it should say ebook on the right side for Connect. For Alex, you should be able to access it as well. Okay, but on Alex, it says second. Like Haven't there's an error when I click okay. on textbook? Try um try on it. Try it on Connect. Yeah, it's usually it's Connect usually better on thing, Connect anyways because it gives you the reading. If you're having trouble with it, stay after class. We'll try to talk about it. All right. Okay. On Connect, it says that there's one attempt for reading the textbook, reading assignment. It's only yes. one attempt? Uh, one attempt, but you can redo the questions as many times as you need. If oh, you're well, still concerned it. about... Yeah, so if you get a question wrong, you keep going. So one attempt means that you only get to submit it once. Uh -oh. So by the due date, you must submit it. Wait, so does that mean we can only read the textbook on the we reading read assignments? The uh, no, there should be a free reading option. So we can read the textbook anytime we want to? Yes. You bought an ebook, you should have access to the ebook at any time. Uh, I don't post the recordings on. Oh, okay. So for the lectures, I can post the recordings, but it's going to take a few days because I save it on my computer here. So it's going to take some time to upload. So I'll try to get a Google Drive folder going and I'll upload it there. Uh, if you're referring to the homework, you can spread it out for as many days as you want, as long as you finish it by the due date. So all I have is you finish it by the due date, you get 100%, you get 100%, you get 90%, you get 90%. Okay. All right, let me go ahead and transition over to chapter, two. actually, uh, if anyone's having trouble with accessing um, Connect or Alex, there is a guide here. Give me one second. All right, so we have a couple of steps here. Uh, for Connect, if you haven't done this yet, just simply click this link right here, uh, enter your email address. If for whatever reason, it won't show up with the, um, it won't show up with the class. So I recommend it refreshing your browser, clearing out your history, or using a different browser. Because sometimes if you took another class that has Connect, it loads that one, it won't load this one. I will not post these slides. I have already posted a modified version of chapter 12. Uh, if you're referring to the, the slides here about the guide and everything, that's already on uh, Blackboard. So in terms of how to access everything here, that's already on Blackboard. Okay. Uh, and to your email address, all the stuff here, you see where I put a big X here? Please don't buy it directly from the website or else you'll be spending $99 for one program. Okay. I put it in red here and in bold as well. These are the links you're going to go ahead and use and buy your stuff. $70, you get both of them. And also, if you're having a technical issue, 99% of the time, I cannot do anything about it. The only thing that you can do is call McGraw-Hill. So they're open pretty late on most days. So you can reach out to them. If it's a technical issue, they can help you. Or if you believe an answer is incorrect, contact them. You can send me an email in the process as well. More than likely, they've gone through the questions multiple times. So there shouldn't be an issue with them. Uh, for Alex here, you log in with the new student, unless you have an account, you put in the code that we have right here. And you enter the financial aid code at the very bottom here. And you get two weeks of free access. If you already purchased it and you have access, just go ahead and uh, enter that in. And for the knowledge check, you start with an initial knowledge check as well. Most of you should have already taken that. Uh, again, initial knowledge check is to check what you know. If you end up having like a 4%, 3%, it's okay. Because if you've never taken this course, I wouldn't expect you to know the stuff, okay? So this is just to gauge what you already know so far. 
So that initial knowledge check, if you don't do well on it, it's okay. All right, and the program, obviously the smart program, it checks what you know, it gives you more challenging problems or easier problems depending on the scenario here. So I'll let you read all of these on your own. And again, customer support option is right here as well. All right, anyone have any questions so far before we begin? All right. So we're gonna jump right into chapter 12. Uh, I do wanna give everyone a little heads up. At around six-ish, sometimes there will be, well, my wife's gonna come back home with my kids. So there will be some noise in the background. So around six-ish is when that will happen. Just letting you know. Okay, so for chapter 12 here, we're gonna learn about intermolecular forces. It focuses on liquid, solids, and the phase changes. So you've, you've pretty much learned about gas laws back in Chem 1. Now we're focusing more on the liquids and the solids. Okay, does anyone need time to settle in before we begin? Get your notebook, get a drink of water, whatever you need. All right, so we're gonna get started. So we're gonna learn about a term called intra versus inter. You've learned about intramolecular forces already. So these are your bonding forces metallic bonding, covalent bonding, ionic bonding. This is the bond within a molecule. So we'll have H2O, for example. It's between the hydrogen and the oxygen. That is an intramolecular force. It is a very, very strong force. What we're gonna focus on is gonna be intermolecular forces, also known as non-bonding forces. So these don't actually don't form real bonds. These are attractions to each other. So they're found between molecules. So between one water molecule and another water molecule. So depending on how strong these forces are, it affects the physical properties, which we will talk about in more detail in a bit. Does anyone need more time with this slide? If you do, you can click the raise hand button so I know. Otherwise, I'm going to move forward. Okay. Give me a few more seconds with the slide. All right, let's continue then. So we're gonna look a little bit at potential and kinetic energy. Um, really simply, potential energy is kind of like the attractive forces, so how close they are to each other, but also the energy that's stored. Kinetic energy is based on movement. So the particle motion, essentially. And that's the main thing you really need from this slide here. So we're gonna look at this in terms of gases, liquids, and solids. We know that solids tend to stay really close together. So the molecules are really close. That has a mostly potential energy, very little kinetic energy. The molecules just vibrate a little bit and that's about it. And we can also look at the general properties. They have a fixed volume and fixed shape. So they don't really change. If you have a cube, you know what shape it is, you know how heavy it is, you know how much space it takes up. Liquid has attractive forces, so things move around. They are pulling at it, but they also have kinetic energy. So liquids, based on their properties, we know that if you fill a bag with water, it takes the shape of that bag, of whatever container it's in but the amount of liquid that you have is limited. So you have a fixed volume, but the shape can change. Gases barely have any attractive forces. They have a lot of kinetic energy. Uh, and for them, the particles are really spread out. If you have gas in a container, whatever shape the container is, that's how much space the gas takes up. If you make the container bigger, it spreads even further, it takes up that shape. And there is no fixed volume either, so it can spread indefinitely. So same thing here, this is just gas, liquid, solid. More about the shape in solid and a little bit about how well you can compress things. Uh, for liquids, you can't really compress them together. So a bag of liquid, you try squeezing that bag, it doesn't shrink anymore. It just stays as is. Gases, however, you can compress that a lot. So you have things such as compressed air. So we store air in a can, it's under a lot of pressure. Solids, essentially no compressibility. You can't squeeze a metal bar any smaller than it is right there. You can change the shape eventually when you heat it up, but you can't change the amount that is there. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump into intermolecular forces. This is, the be, this is gonna be the part that we focus on. So this is all based on attraction, based on partial charges. They also refer to it as, as dipoles when we talk about that, and they have dipole moments. So some end, the electrons are moving left and right or moving around any particular um, molecule, and sometimes one side has more electrons than the other, so that causes that side to be more negative, and that's gonna have a negative charge. Something else that has a more positive charge is gonna be attracted to that. So intermolecular forces is all based on attraction. 
And in terms of strength, these are significantly weaker compared to bonding forces. So intra is stronger than inter. So to give you an example of what I'm referring to here, pay attention to the energies here, okay? So ionic, covalent, metallic, they all range from 400 to 4,000, 150 to 1,000, 75 to 1,000, okay? Now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our first intermolecular force. These are your intermolecular forces. So even the strongest intermolecular force, this doesn't even ex exceed 1,000. The highest it goes up to is about like 600 kilojoules per mole. So once again, in comparison, we always try to make sure we compare things relatively. These are significantly stronger than these right here. So your intra is stronger than your inter. There's gonna be a couple of these that we focus on. We're gonna focus on ion dipole, hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, and dispersion. I don't really need to worry so much about ion induced dipole and dipole induced dipole. They're just kind of like in between those. So if you know dipole dipole, you know dispersion, also known as London dispersion, hydrogen bond and ion dipole, you're good to go. Those are the four main ones we're gonna focus on. Any questions? All right. So Professor, which one is it strong again? The strongest one based on this list is your ion dipole. So we can look at the energy amounts here. We should memorize the energy or no? Uh, no, you don't have to memorize the energy. You just have to know which one's stronger. If it helps you to memorize the energy, then by all means. Thank you. Okay. So first one we're going to talk about is actually going to be dipole-dipole. It falls right into the middle of all of these. So dipole-dipole means that one end of this is positive, one end of this negative. Okay. And that partial, so it's not 100% negative and 100% positive. So if I draw a molecule here, one end is positive, one end is negative. This is actually a partial positive and a partial negative. So what that essentially means, if I go ahead and draw an example here, HCl, this molecule. How many of you remember the term electronegativity? You can click one, the raise one. hand button if you remember it, or at least you've heard of it. I'm hoping all of you have heard of it. Okay. So which one of these is more electronegative? You can pull information from high school chemistry or from college chemistry, chlorine, right? So chlorine is ele more electronegative. What that means is it wants more electrons. So it's gonna go ahead, if we're talking about electrons here, this has one electron and this one's one electron, right? So this has seven in total actually, and this has one. So they're sharing these two electrons. What essentially means is that because chlorine is more electronegative, that one electron is not here. It's probably right here. So it's closer to the chlorine. Go ahead and erase that, okay? So once again, that is closer to the chlorine. And what that essentially means is that when I look at the overall charge, it's more negative here, it's more positive here because the electron is closer to the chlorine side, okay? So it's not a full taken away. So it's not fully negative, fully positive. This is, they're sharing it. So this is in a covalent bond. So once again, this side's partially negative, partially positive. They use this symbol right here to kind of indicate partial. So you can see here, this side's a positive, this side's a negative, right? That negative is going to be attracted to a positive or any other positive source that it sees. So it is that attraction, these dotted lines that you see, that is your intermolecular force. In this particular case, it is your dipole-dipole interaction. Okay. The next one we're going to talk about is hydrogen bond. This is still a dipole-dipole interaction. So it's still considered dipole-dipole, still in that category. The only difference here is that I am now looking at something that has one of these three with hydrogen. So we have hydrogen on one end. That's without question. But it is covalently bonded to something that has nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. We'll use fluorine for now, okay? Now, these three things, what's important about them is that they, are, they have lone pairs and they are the most electronegative atoms. So when they're the most electronegative atoms, what that means is it takes in more electrons. It pulls it closer to itself. So instead of being the dot right here that we said before, right, it's probably over here. So the two dots are even closer. Okay. And what that means is that this is even more negative and this is even more positive. So the best way for that I like to remember this is when I write my partials, I like to just call this a double negative, And this is a double positive. Now, this doesn't mean that it's twice as strong. This just simply tells me that it's more positive, more negative. So the differences are even greater. Okay. And with that bigger difference, what that means is that 
this positive, since it's more positive, it's gonna be attracted to something that's more negative. So right here in that dotted line, this means that the attraction is stronger. So it's kind of like saying, if you, were, if you were having a tug of war with someone, they held one end of the rope, you held one end of the rope with one hand. Because we're looking at hydrogen bonding, you held it with two hands, they held it with two hands. So your attraction is stronger or your grip and close, you'll be closer to each other essentially. Any questions so far? All right. And this can only happen once again, if you have a hydrogen covalently bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So that molecule has to have that covalent bond between them. This way the hydrogen gives its electron further to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, making the hydrogen more positive, which is why it's called hydrogen bond. Now, I don't want you to get confused though. Remember, hydrogen bond is still just a non-bonding force, it's an attraction. There's no actual bonding happening here, only in the covalent bond itself of the molecule. Okay, the next one we're gonna talk about is London dispersion forces. Actually, before we talk about London dispersion forces, as long as you see an ion, so anything from like group one, group two, any of those metals, that's usually gonna form an ion because they're very, very strong metals. So if you see one of those, you assume that there's an ion present, so you can assume ion dipole. Now, ion dipole is stronger than hydrogen bonding. It doesn't really show up that often. So the three main categories you're gonna focus on is hydrogen bonding, which is a form of dipole-dipole, a stronger form of it. Then there's dipole-dipole, which means that there's a difference in electron activity. One side is more positive, one side is more negative, which makes it polar. Now, London dispersion forces, this usually happens in things where it is non-polar. So to clarify what you're asking in chat, a lot of these slides are not in there because I said the PowerPoint that I'm gonna post on Blackboard is a skeleton slide. It's just the very basics, some main topics, that's it. If you want the information, you're getting it from what we have right here. No problem. Okay, so London dispersion forces is the minimal force across everything. So things that let's say chlorine and chlorine, right? there is no difference in electron activity. So they share the electrons evenly. So there's no real difference, but something is causing the chlorine molecules and other chlorine molecules to be attracted to each other. That is known as your London dispersion forces. Sometimes they call it van der Waals forces. So this is the minimal force. Everything in existence, any molecule with another molecule has some kind of London dispersion force attraction. So this is the minimal force. Otherwise you'd have molecules floating everywhere separately and there's no attraction pulling anything close. Now, Obviously, the more polar it is, the more stronger it is. And the larger the molecule, the more stronger the dispersion force in general. So here, you can say that size matters because the larger it is, the more stronger it is. Any questions? Okay. So as I mentioned, the molar mass, which means the size, the larger it is, the greater the boiling point. And we're gonna talk about why boiling point matters here. It is one of our physical properties. But essentially, the greater the mass, the stronger the intermolecular force. And that's all the information you really need from this slide. This is just to give you a visual of it. Okay, so let's say we have a scenario. Sorry, did you say intermolecular um, force? Or intermolecular intra? force, inter. So everything we're talking about here is inter. So intro was based on the stuff you learned previously. We're just comparing intro to inter at the beginning. Everything else we talk about now is all inter. So think of it like international between two nations. Okay, so for this slide right here, if you had the same type of force and the same mass, so we assume that they're, the intermolecular force is the same. There's one other thing that can change the intermolecular force and that is shape. So we compare the shapes here. There's less dispersion forces acting on it. So this one, the, the straight line chain, usually is the one that has a greater force. Uh, for those of you that are taking the Chem 114 lab, I believe your first lab exploring boiling points, I don't know if it's still the same now, they might've changed based on the online format, but the original first lab that you take exploring boiling points touches upon intermolecular forces. So you will need this information. Okay, so this is gonna help you. The straight line chain, it's gonna have a higher intermolecular force, stronger intermolecular force compared to the branched ones. So keep that in mind. You will need this for your lab. Okay, 
let's continue. So once again, to clarify, covalent bonds are between your hydrogen and your oxygen. That's the actual solid line bond. This is an intramolecular force. Okay, I'll just type intra here so you have that. Okay, hydrogen bond is the dotted lines, is the attraction between this hydrogen here and, this, and the oxygen of another molecule. So this is your intermolecular force. One is within the molecule, one is between molecules. Any questions up to this point? So, could you explain again hydrogen bond? Okay, sure. Uh, just hydrogen bond or just this part right here? Do you want to know what hydrogen bond is itself or do you want to know what how it is in relationship to this? How this is a relationship. Okay, so this is one molecule, right? So these are all individual molecules that I'm circling right now or boxing. So these three, Right. If you look at the line in between them right here, this is what makes this bond. This is a covalent bond. This is the structure itself. Okay. This thing and this one are two different molecules. So they're attracted to each other based on a positive charge and a negative charge. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to recap, yes, covalent bond is stronger than hydrogen bond. You need to have this bond formed first before you can have this attraction. This is not actually an attraction. So hydrogen bond, even though this says the word bond, there is no bond. This is an attraction between these two water molecules. Covalent is intramolecular force and hydrogen bond is intramolecular force. That's correct. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at identifying things. So the very first thing, if you have any molecule, we assume we have more than one of that molecule, okay? But we're gonna look at that one individual molecule first. If I have any particular molecule and it has an ion present, then I can assume that there is some kind of form of ionic bonding or ion dipole present. And this is the strongest force, okay? Now we're gonna put that to the side. I'm not gonna look at this part. So the next thing I'm gonna look at is, is this molecule polar or nonpolar? Does anybody remember the definition of polar? This goes back to Chem 1. Does polarity have to do with the difference of electronegativities? That's correct. So, and it also uneven charges has a positive negative side. So that's all, all these answers you're giving are correct. So. As long as there's a difference in electronegativity, greater than I would say 0.4 of a difference, but that's a negligible number. So as long as there's a difference and quite a major difference, we can see that one side is gonna be more positive, one side is gonna be more negative. It's not gonna be a full positive or full negative, but there's gonna be more positive and more negative on each of those sides. So as long as there is a difference, it is considered polar. The second that it is a polar molecule, we know that as a dipole-dipole force, without question. Even if it was hydrogen bonding, this is still dipole-dipole. So this entire thing is dipole-dipole, okay? Yes, if we're talking about hydrogen bonding in general, then we know that it's connected to one of these. These all have negative and positive. They're gonna be attracted to each other. So once again, if it is a polar molecule, there's a difference in electronegativity, one side's positive or partially positive, one side's partially negative, it's considered dipole-dipole. Now, when we look further, we can find out if this dipole-dipole is considered a hydrogen bond or not. That's one of the categories. So we know it's dipole-dipole. We just have to find out if it's hydrogen bonding or not. If the hydrogen is covalently bonded to one of these structures, one of these three, then that means that this is more negative and this is more positive, which makes this hydrogen bonding. So it's a stronger dipole-dipole. Any questions so far? So to make things easy, we're gonna skip past this part right here. Yes, covalently bonded. So the H has to have a solid line connected to this F or the H has to have a solid line connected to the O or H has to have a solid line connected to the N, not the dotted lines, which is the attraction. Now, once again, to save ourselves some trouble, skip past this part. 
it's just dipole induced dipole forces. Don't worry about it. Non-polar molecules, dispersion only. So I'm gonna tell you one thing, everything here has dispersion forces, okay? So if I'm looking at something like this, HF, this has hydrogen bonding. This does not have ionic bonding or ionic dipole, di ion dipole, but it has hydrogen bonding, which means that it is also a dipole dipole. So it is both these categories right here. But at the same time, dispersion forces exist everywhere. So it also has this. So if a question comes up, you see HF, it says what forces are present, you would say all three of these forces are present. Okay. If, however, I said which one was the strongest force, you would tell me hydrogen bonding. But those are just an example of some questions that may come up. Just based on that same information, the same question right here, same topic, we can ask the question in two ways, and you have to answer it in two different ways. Okay, let's continue. So I want you to go ahead and try drawing the hydrogen bonds. Assume you have more than one of these molecules. So you assume there's two of these molecules. Does it have hydrogen bonding? If it does, draw the hydrogen bonds. I'll give you some time to work on that. Maybe about a minute or two. Okay, does anyone else still need more time? All right, so for the first one, do we have hydrogen bonding, yes or no? Okay, second one, do we have hydrogen bonding, yes or no? All right, and the third one, do we have hydrogen bonding, yes or no? All right. So I'm glad we're all in agreement. We can see that there is hydrogen bonding because these are covalently bonded together, okay? So if we look at the examples here, first one has no hydrogen bond, second one does. You can combine it through here. This hydrogen from this molecule is attracted to this oxygen, the lone pair. And then down here, this NH2 right here, the hydrogen is again attracted to the lone pair of the, lone, of the oxygen or attracted to the lone pair of the other nitrogen. So both methods work. Okay, any questions? All right. The reason why A is not attracted to, uh, is not a hydrogen bond is because it is not covalently bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. It's only covalently bonded to carbon. So there's not a big difference in electron activity there. Okay, so why do we care about intermolecular forces? Now, the reason why we care about it is because it actually affects a lot of the physical properties that we know. So the stronger your intermolecular force, you can say it's an increase in the boiling point, melting point, surface tension, viscosity. The only thing it lowers is vapor pressure. So if you're trying to copy this down really quickly, Put a big arrow here. Everything is increased, and then this one is decreased. And we'll talk more about the vapor pressure in a bit. Now, this slide should also help you with your lab. Paying attention to the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point. OK, does anyone else still need more time with this? All right, give me a few more seconds with it. OK. 
Okay, let's continue. So vapor pressure and boiling point. So the boiling point in general just means that the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. That's when things start to bubble and escape into the atmosphere. So vapor pressure is based off of the pressure exerted onto the liquid from right above it. So we actually, if we want something that to boil at a higher temperature, right? Or that means we have a strong intermolecular force. That means the vapor pressure is going to be lower. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about live trans transcription. I'll enable it, but I'm not exactly sure what that can do. That's actually a nice feature. Never knew that. Okay, so let's continue then. Uh, once again, boiling point and vapor pressure are related to each other, but ideally you want to look at the intermolecular forces. The stronger the intermolecular force, the lower the vapor pressure. Any questions so far? All right, let's continue. So there are two factors mainly that we focus on that affect vapor pressure. The weaker the intermolecular force, the higher the vapor pressure. The higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. Any questions? And a good way to remember this, if you look at it, if it's a lower, weaker intermolecular force, it's easier to boil. If it's easier to boil, it turns into gas. There's more gas, there's more vapor that makes a higher pressure of the vapor. Higher the temperature means that you have more of it changing into gas, also means higher pressure. So anybody more time? All right. So we can see that, well, you've probably seen something similar to this back in high school chemistry. You've seen this in your reference table where you saw the relation between vapor pressure and the temperature. Any questions before we continue? Okay. So we're gonna talk about the equation here, clausius clapeyron equation. Uh, generally speaking, this is the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. The top equation um, starts with just one pressure and one temperature. The one you're going to focus on is the one down here. We tend to look at two different points. So these two temperatures, and you're given one of the vapor pressure, you should be able to figure out what the other vapor pressure is going to be at that other temperature. So once again, this is the equation you're going to get used to using. It will show up more than likely one question on the quiz and pretty much guaranteed one question on the final, at least. And it's a very straightforward, it's a plug and play. You plug in what it, what it asks for and you have all the information you need. You're looking for one variable, usually pressure or temperature. P is pressure, yes. Delta H is the heat of vaporization, which we will talk about later on as well. LN is the natural logarithm. So uh, things that we will cover in terms of math, you will want to know your natural log and the relationship with E, and also just the regular log and the relationship with 10 to the something power. So if you don't remember that, I recommend Googling it and reviewing it as quickly as you can, because it will come up later on. Okay, does anyone else still need more time? So let's jump back. We're gonna talk about each of these pairs here. And I want you to go ahead and tell me which one of these two, so for A here, MgCl2 or PCl3, which one of these has a higher boiling point, which also means is a stronger intermolecular force. So I'll give you some time to look at it. We have four problems to go through. Let's give everyone a chance to go through it first, go through all four of these and then start answering.
Okay, does anyone else still need more time? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and look at each one of these. Remember, you're picking either left or right. Okay, so if we're looking at A, you're picking either MgCl2 or PCl3. Which one of these has a higher boiling point? You're not picking multiple choice between them. There are four questions. Okay, so for the very first one, we're looking at this one right here. You can either type in MgCl2 or PCl3. Which one has a higher boiling point? See a couple of answers already? And the answer is actually gonna be MgCl2. That one has a higher boiling point. You can solve it by comparing molecular masses only if they are the same type of force. Mg here is group one. It is a metal. That means this makes it an ionic bond, ion dipole. P is phosphorus. So this is a non, well, this would be essentially nonpolar. Or at most, it would be dipole-dipole. This one right here has an ion dipole, so it is significantly stronger. Okay, next one here. You can say left or right to make it a little easier for yourself. Okay, so the answer is going to actually be the left side. The reason why is because these are both hydrogen bonds, so they're both the same type of force, right? They're both the, one of the strongest forces. Now, the question is, we well, let's look at mass. Which one of these is the larger mass? So this is actually would be a larger mass in the process. Okay. Next one here. Oh, sorry, this one right here. Methanol or ethanol? And the answer would be ethanol. So CH3, CH2OH, just because there is a larger mass in the process. And then the very last one here, this is the entire problem here. Which one of these has a higher boiling point, the left or the right? Okay, and the answer is going to be the left side. Now, both of these have the same molecular mass. They come out to the same amount. They're both di um, London dispersion forces. This one is a straight chain alkane. This one is a branched one. Remember, branched ones are actually lower in their boiling point. The linear one, the straight line one, is the one that has a stronger intermolecular force. And you will need to know this for your lab. So for anyone writing their labs, you want to make sure that you include this information. There's a larger surface area and more of this is interacting with the surface around it. This one has stuff stuck in the middle of it. Okay, so we're just gonna go through these really quickly. Same stuff we just spoke about, higher boiling point, higher boiling point, higher boiling point. Okay, any questions before we continue? All right, and these are the actual boiling points. Again, you're not expected to memorize the actual boiling point. All right, so let's talk about phase changes now. This should be very, very familiar. Uh, we have exothermic and endothermic reactions. One side you're adding heat, one side you're removing heat. So you should memorize these terms. As you go from solid to liquid to gas, it's called melting or fusion. And then this one's called vaporization. Condensation, freezing, and then you get sublimation and deposition. Anyone have any questions? Now, more surface area is referring to the more surface area between molecules. So the molecules are being attracted to each other. So if they're, think of like, as extra, think of it as extra hands. If you're holding hands with someone, you only just one hand with them versus two hands, you have a stronger grip with two hands. So it's harder to separate you. In order to boil something, you're separating the molecules. 
Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, does anybody need time to copy this down? All right, give you a few more seconds with it. Yes. So perspective wise, if you're looking at an object, if that object is releasing heat, that is exothermic. Where it releases the heat to, that is essentially endothermic because it is receiving the heat outside. So whatever is outside is undergoing endothermic reaction. The object itself is re it's releasing heat, then it's exothermic. All right, so let's continue. So this is just a little bit of information on heat of vaporization, heat of fusion. Uh, you see that it's positive here and negative on the right side. So this is the energy needed. It could be in moles or it could be in grams to change something from a liquid to a gas or from the bottom here for fusion, solid to a liquid or vice versa from a liquid to a solid. It's a negative symbol of it. So this is the energy needed to do that. That's what your delta H vaporization is. And since earlier we were looking at vapor pressure, this was the energy needed to change that liquid into a gas. Okay. So we're gonna talk about a term called the heat uh, cooling curve in this case, but they refer to it as the heating cooling curve. So in the diagram you see here, this is a cooling curve, it goes from gas down to solid. A, a heating curve would be the opposite. It would go like that. So it's important we know this because we're actually going to be doing calculations for each one of these lines here. We're going to be calculating how much energy it takes to get to each of these points here. So I'll give you a second if you want to copy down the diagram, then we're going to talk about it. Now this applies for all substances. So any substance has three phases. Now, is it easy to achieve those three phases? Probably not. So for example, nitrogen, it is probably really hard to get solid nitrogen. You've probably heard of liquid nitrogen being very, very cold. So it depends on the pressure and the temperature situation, but every single substance in the world can have up to three phases. It could be solid, liquid, or gas, depending on the temperature and pressure that it's at. Plasma is the fourth one, but we don't learn about plasma here. You learn about that in physics. Okay. So if you look here, we're just going to talk a little bit about it. All that's happening here is that this is still in the solid phase. You have one temperature here and one temperature here, right? Whatever those two temperatures are, but that's the entire line here, where you are at the bottom and where you are at the top here. If we look at this category right here, they are all at the same temperature. So the temperature does not change. Delta H is tied in with the energy needed. And we're gonna talk more about that. So Delta H fusion here, this is related to pretty much the energy needed to change a solid to liquid or liquid to solid. But if you look carefully here, these have the same temperature. So I'm not changing the temperature in this scenario. So if this was water, for example, this is at zero, then this is, zero degrees Celsius ice and zero degrees Celsius water. And if you look here, this is the same thing. At 100 degrees, you have liquid and you have gas, but the temperature stays the same. The only time you're changing temperature is within a phase. Okay, with that said, let's take a look at the next slide. So we have two calculations we're gonna work with, okay? These are two equations you do want to copy down and you want to know how to apply them and you want to memorize them. So the very first one, anytime we're dealing within a phase, so the solid, the liquid, or the gas, if you notice it says Q here, Q represents heat. This is the amount of heat that we're trying to calculate. Yep, heat is only, temperature changes within, only within a phase. So the word amount here, I put it as amount because it can refer to as mass or moles, depending on what your conditions are. So if you're given some kind of constant and it gives it to you in kilojoules per mole, for example, you want your amount in moles. So you're always adjusting your stuff to match it. And you notice here it says delta T. 
So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the previous slide for a second. Delta T only applies for scenarios where there is a change in the temperature. So you see how there's a, it's at an angle here. These are all changes in temperature. So these are the scenarios where we are applying that equation. Okay. Now heat capacity is very unique. It depends on two things, the type of substance and the phase the substance is in. Once again, heat capacity depends on two things, type of substance, and the phase that the substance is in. So if I look at water, there are three different heat capacities for water. The form in ice, the form in water vapor, and the form in liquid water. If I look at carbon dioxide, same thing. Solid carbon dioxide, liquid carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide in gas form. So there's three different heat capacities, one for each of the phases per substance. Now we also look down here, this is still looking at heat, this is during a phase change. As I change from liquid to solid or solid to liquid or gas to liquid and get uh, liquid to gas. That is where we apply the delta H. The amount depends on mass or moles, depending on what your units are. That's why I left it as the word amount. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. There are some things that you will want to memorize. So once again, delta H is a phase change. This could be delta H vaporization or delta H fusion, depending on which one we're looking at. And I strongly emphasize for you to pay attention to the units. Does anyone else need more time to copy this slide down? Okay. So let's talk about heat capacity. We're going to use water as an example here. I have ice, water, and steam. These are the three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas. These are numbers that are already, these are constants. They are determined already. Okay. So you will want to copy these down. Uh, I converted these into joules for moles for you as well, so you can go ahead and copy that down if you choose to use that format instead. Generally speaking, you will be usually working with joules per gram. Okay, now we also have the delta H phase changes. This is for the vaporization, this is for the fusion. So this is pretty much the relationship between gas and liquid or liquid to gas, and this one is solid and liquid. Okay, uh, it's given to you in kilojoules per mole, also in joules per gram. I'm giving you both scenarios. So if I said to you that I had some kind of ice cube that was, we'll just say this is 20 grams, okay? And I changed that ice cube, it was at zero degrees Celsius, and I changed it into water at zero degrees Celsius. The mass has not changed. Which of these five would you use, and what is our equation? It's changing from a solid to a liquid. The temperature has not changed. We would use Q is equal to the amount times delta fusion, yes. Which of the two delta fusions would you use? Okay, so we know it's within phase change. Which of these two would you use? I have kilojoules per mole and joules per gram. So it's easier to use joules per gram because this is in grams. So I would just simply multiply these two numbers and get my answer in joules. Now you can convert this into moles, then multiply by this number, and then get your value in kilojoules. It would still give you the similar answer, if not the same answer, but why put in that extra work, okay? If everything is in joules already and grams, keep it in joules and grams. If everything is in kilojoules and moles, keep it in kilojoules and moles. If you have a mixture of both of them, well, then you have to work with both of them. Any questions? Okay, I want you to take a second, copy this down. These are values that you want to memorize. I mean, I'm sure you can look them up online, but ideally, if you memorize them, it'll be a lot more easier when you apply these. 99% of the time when you're working with any kind of heat capacity, they like to use water because these constants are known. For your Alex homework, they will use things that are not water, like hexane, for example. But for most things that are physical examinations like quizzes, tests, they tend to use water. 
So if you memorize these numbers, you'll recognize it really fast. You know which one it is. You know what you're doing. Okay. Last call. Does anyone still need time to copy this? Okay. So let's look at a scenario here. I'll give you some time to copy it down, look over it, and then we're going to try to solve it. Okay. Okay, really quickly by a show of hands, who's having trouble with this on how to start? Okay, who just needs more time to solve it? Me as well. Okay. I'll give everyone about another minute for this one and then we'll go over it. Okay, so first thing we want to do here is I want you to just identify if we are releasing heat or absorbing heat. Are we putting heat into it or are we taking it away? We're putting heat in, right? It is absorbing heat, okay? And we can tell by the temperature change. If there's an increase in temperature, usually there's an increase in the amount of energy that's being absorbed, all right? Now, with that said, what phase is this in? Just by looking at it, we're assuming this is H2O. It says 85 degrees Celsius. So this should be a liquid. Okay. If it's below zero degrees Celsius, it should be a solid. Now, what phase is this in? Gas, right? So we are looking at the heating cooling curve. If I drew the entire heating cooling curve, it would look like that. This would be your solid, this would be your liquid, this would be your gas. Now, I'm not asking for the whole thing, right? I'm asking from somewhere in the liquid phase to somewhere in the gas phase. So somewhere like right there, up to like somewhere right there. That's what I'm looking at. I don't care about the solids because this we're assuming this is water, then this is at zero degrees right here, and this is at 100 right here, okay? So we obviously are not at zero, so we can go ahead and ignore that. In liquid, we're somewhere up here, up by 85 degrees Celsius. That's where we're beginning. We get to 100, then we have this flat line where we change from liquid to gas, then we increase it again to get to 117 degrees Celsius. Does this make sense so far? All right. With that said, we have the liquid phase here. We have a flat line here, and we have that. I have three different equations I need to work with, OK? So to help us figure this out, first equation, I know I have Q is equal to. And then we have here, we know that it's amount times specific heat times delta T. So luckily for us, this is in mass. So I can put this as M. Specific heat can be called C. And then we have delta T or triangle T, okay? 
A good way to remember this if you're having trouble, if you write this as your delta T symbol, then this is essentially Q is equal to M cat. So that's one way to remember if you're having trouble with it. So the delta T is something we're going to be calculating. C, we know the value because we have it from our previous page, right? This is going to be liquid or water liquid. So what is that number right here? What is C? What are our units? Give me the numbers Four. and... Sorry, 4.20 joule per gram degree Celsius. Yep, 4.20 or 4.8, depending on what you want to write, joules per gram. So you always want to write these units in, okay? You don't want to leave those units out. What is our M? 24.3 grams, okay? So we're just writing these things in. What is my delta T? So this is very important. What is the value of my delta T? Okay, I see a bunch of numbers coming up. So some of you are saying 32, some of you uh, are saying 40.7. So remember something here. Look at our three lines here, okay? Right now, I am only calculating one thing. I'm only calculating this part. This is 100 on top, this is 85, okay? Water cannot be higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So this only goes up to here, which means that my delta T, let's go ahead and just erase all this. My delta T is actually equal to 15. It's 100 minus 85, okay? So if you went ahead and took the subtraction between this, it wouldn't make sense because you need to account for all three components. The first part is you're heating it up from 85 to 100. That's in the liquid phase. Then you're changing it from liquid to gas. And then finally, you're heating it from 100 to 117. So if you try to put it all together, you're not going to get the right answer. OK, so let's take a look at what the results are here. There's three phases, 85 to 100, 100 to 100, liquid to gas, and then 100 to 117. So these are your three different phases, that we're, or three different calculations that we're going to work with. So you have to account for each of these lines, yes. So if we go back a few slides, the maximum number of calculations that you have to do if you were given the entire thing is five of these. So the maximum number of equations you're gonna work with here are five of them. And if we look very carefully, three of these all have delta T, two of these all have delta H of some sort. So the maximum you have is three of these and two of these. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So with that said, we're only looking at this top portion here, just these three lines, all right? So the very first one, in this scenario here, they changed it into moles because they wanted to work with moles because they wanted to work purely out of moles, and that's fine. So they used N instead of M representing moles. So the moles times the specific heat of water in the liquid form times the delta T, which happens to be 15 here. So the difference in the temperature, water, the maximum temperature that water boils at is 100. After that, it has to change phases, which is another sort of energy, and then it can raise in temperature in the form of steam. So water's maximum temperature at normal atmospheric pressure is 100 degrees Celsius. Does that make sense? Okay. So for those of you that wanted an alternate method right here, this is exactly what we just spoke about. Same thing, this one decided to use moles instead and, this, con and uh, this constant, you use this constant, so it's the same thing. So 18.02 is the molar mass of water. So that's where we take the, the mass divided by the molar mass, you get 1.35 moles. So again, this one's a little more complicated than necessary. If you know the, if you've memorized these two constants, you can just choose the one that's easier to work with. So instead of working with the one in moles and changing this to moles, just plug this one in and you're good to go. Okay, any questions about this first page right here? This is our first part, stage one. All right, so stage two, the only thing we're doing here is we are going to go ahead and change the phase. How much energy does it change 
does it take to change the phase? We have no delta T, no temperature change. Okay? So I am changing from liquid to gas. You can go ahead and use either of these two equations up here. If you notice, they give you the same value, right? So this is 1.35 moles. So the moles we already calculated from before. I multiply it by that constant, and I get this value. Do the same thing here. This time I can use the mass, multiply by this number that you should have memorized, and you get that. Okay? Any questions up to this point? Now, the last part we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and heat that gas from 100 to 117. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward. I can use, once again, the mole equation here, or I can use the mass equation, as long as I have the constants matching correctly. And they all have the same delta T, 17. Now, obviously, the number may be a little bit off. So you see the numbers here are just slightly off. But generally speaking, because we're dealing with kilojoules, these numbers are very insignificant, the amount that's different. So if you look at the two scenarios down here, I calculated the Q total, the total amount of energy for all three stages. In the original format, it comes up to 57.19. In the other format, when we're looking at this in terms of um, mass, it comes up to 57.26. So it's almost pretty much the same. Either one of these answers would be correct. Any questions? And yes, the bottom one looks easier because we're dealing with just mass. Now, if you're not given the mass at all and you're only given the moles, then you would need to convert the moles into mass. It makes this bottom step a little bit harder. This slide or the slide before that? Give me a few more seconds with it. All right. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about phase diagrams. Uh, the phase diagram is similar to the heating cooling curve. It gives you information, but keep in mind, the heating cooling curve is based off of heat on the bottom, right? And then temperature on the left side. Here it is pressure on the left side, temperature on the bottom, okay? And this one, doesn't tell you about a thing called triple point. That is only on the uh, phase diagram here. So a phase diagram kind of tells you at a particular temperature and a particular pressure, it'll tell you whether this substance is in the solid, liquid, or gas phase. Okay? Now, some key things to point out here. Triple point is a very unique one. If you can get this exact temperature and this exact pressure, the substance that you have in front of you is in all three forms. It is a solid, it is a liquid, and it is a gas. Now, that's something that's kind of hard to imagine, but if you can get this exact pressure, this exact temperature, all three phases exist. Now, anything past this critical point here it becomes a thing called a supercritical fluid. So it is something that's kind of a mixture between liquid and gas. It's hard to distinguish between the two. So anything further up on the top right, makes it kind of blurred. So this whole area is a blur of liquid and gas. Now, obviously, as we switch between these lines here, right? One side solid, one side is liquid. So going to the right, it is melting. Going to the left, it is freezing. Same thing over here. Sometimes you're going to see this, the one ATM. What this essentially tells me is that this is the normal, um, normal pressure in the environment. So if this passes through, let's say here, right? That makes this point right here the normal freezing point. It makes this point right here the normal boiling point. Carbon dioxide happens to be all the way down here. That's why when we go ahead and drop uh, solid dry ice, right? So solid CO2, it immediately changes into uh, gas CO2. So it skips past the liquid phase because it is at a lower pressure. At higher pressures, it will include all three phases here. Now, the other thing I want to point out, this line is very important. If the line is sloped as a positive slope this way, what that means is that this solid is more dense than the liquid. So if I put this solid right here, this uh, dry ice into CO2 liquid, it should sink to the bottom because it is more dense. Sometimes you may get a scenario where it's the opposite, where it's a negative slope. That tells me that the solid is less dense than the liquid. So in other words, the solid will float in the liquid. Can you think of a scenario where that happens? Ice in water, okay? And that's one of the unique things. 
if we look here, H2O, it's on a negative slope here, okay? So this tells me that this solid, this ice, will float in liquid. That's actually part of why life exists. When things freeze over on a lake, you have the solid layer of ice on top, but it stays floating. It doesn't sink down and crush all the life below it. So things underneath the water can still survive. And very few substances are like this. So in terms of phase diagram, if you see this negative line, so in other words, the slope is going this way, assume that it is water. In most cases, that's going to be the situation. And if you look here, we have that one ATM. This is our normal freezing point and our normal boiling point. Okay, any questions so far? Professor, actually, I have a quick question. Go ahead. So what, what if it, it falls exactly on the line? What, what would we say then that it can be either solid or uh, let's say uh, it lands uh, between solid and liquid on the line? Would we say it could be a solid or liquid depending on? It's both at that point. It's both? Yeah. So okay. same thing with the heating cooling curve, right? If you yeah. end up right here, this is your solid, this is your liquid. This is a mixture between solid and liquid. It's changed. If you're going in this direction, it's changing from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, but that equilibrium right here. Okay. So if you get something, let's say you have exactly zero degrees Celsius and you have a cup of ice water, it's at equilibrium. Some of it's changing into ice, some of it's changing to water, enough so that it's not really changing. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, does anyone else still need more time with this? Positive slope means that the solid is more dense than liquid. So this is a positive slope. Right now, what you see in front of you is a negative slope. So this is where the solid is less dense. So in other words, ice floats on water. In this scenario, solid or whatever sinks in that liquid form. So all substances generally follow that it's a positive trend. Only water and a very few substances follow this, this one right here with a negative trend. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, we're, we're going to probably try to wonder why is this the case? Why is the solid less dense than water? And this actually brings us back to the hydrogen bonding. So if I look at this one hydrogen bond or one water molecule in the middle, right? So if I draw it like this, this has two lone pairs and two hydrogens, right? This is one molecule. This has a partial negative on up here and partial positive down here. And any one water molecule, this is very important, can form four hydrogen bonds. One this way, one this way, one this way, and one this way. And it forms it in the sense that this right here, the two lone pairs, this is not a 2D structure. Think of this as the two dots are coming towards you and the other two dots are going away from you. So this is kind of like a tetrahedral shape. So you might have learned about that in your VSEPR back in Chem 1. You'll learn about that again when you go off to organic, where they learn about 3D shapes, OK? So one's coming towards you, one's going away from you. Think of that in the page. One coming towards you and one going away. So in terms of that, you get a tetrahedral shape, and you get these four hydrogen bonds surrounding this one water molecule. And with that said, you get structures like this in ice. So it actually kind of, when it turns to ice, it takes a more rigid structure. Instead of moving about, it's more solid, right? So it pushes it out a little bit and actually gets spaced out. And because of that, it becomes less dense because density is based on how much you have packed into a spot. Sure. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a quick poll. Uh, just a few questions. You're going to go ahead and just answer those questions as quick as you can. This one won't count against you if you get it wrong. It's more of just understanding where you are and just some information I want to gather from you. So go ahead and begin that poll. And then we're going to end it here on this slide. Give you about two minutes to answer questions. Most of these are pretty straightforward.
Now, these polls are going to show up maybe in the middle of the class, or it could be at the end of class. It's going to be counted as part of your participation. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have an option that says polls. It should be there. You click on that button. It should be next to chat, maybe next to new share, whatever, or whatever it might be. It'll vary uh, four or five questions generally around that number. I try not to give too many. Uh, professor, I just have a, a for the last one. Uh, you say it's like the quote unquote first and quote unquote last. My question is, is it the very last choice or is that's, it the words? First? That's for you to determine. Okay, thank you. But this is my test of your attention to detail. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll in about 30 seconds. Professor, what would you say is the best way to go through this class to take good notes from the textbook and then listen to lecture and see what you applied from lecture or to work really hard on the recordings of lecture um, because you're not making the final, it's going to be coming through the department anyways. Uh, all of the above is what I'm going to say. Read the textbook first, take notes from it. Use my lecture as a review. Okay. And the rest uh, of it. Yeah, use a recitation as a review. Both of those should be review. So by the time you get to our classes, it should be stuff you've already learned about and you have questions about or you need refining in it. That's about it. And the Alex is due basically what you have one section to do per week or, or it's once every two weeks. Uh, so right now, um, the next time we meet is going to be the 14th, right? We're okay. going to finish chapter 12. By that day, you should already finish. Um, you should have already finished the connect beforehand, 40 no, minutes beforehand. Connect. Alex, because Alex takes a long time to do it. Alex, it's due one week after we finish chapter 12. Okay. So next week we finish chapter 12, you have until the week after 11.59 p.m. to finish. Okay. And the grade would be the averages of all the yes. Okay. How much you've completed. So one week you don't do well, it's not going to really kill you. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the poll real quick. Again, we are finished. So if you need to go to your next class, go ahead and do so. Uh, if you are waiting for office hours, I will close out this program and then reopen it again so you can rejoin for office hours. I see a lot of you are pre-health or required for major. Two people like to torture themselves and two people watch Breaking Bad. Um, number of homework programs you signed up for, it is two. Number of quizzes I drop, it is one. And seems like majority of you Got the correct answer for the last question. All right. Professor, if I may ask, was it when I was asking you that it was the ones so, I was saying, no? It was exactly the words that I typed in. So okay. first with a dot and last without a dot. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the program for anyone who just happens to not be there. And then reopen it. You just rejoin the questions. Okay. All right. Have a great night, Professor. Thank you so right. much. You too. All right. This yeah. is also to save the recording so it's not including questions that you have afterwards. Okay. Good All night, right. Professor. Thank you so much. Where are you posting the recording again? I am going to post a recording. I'm going to try to post it on Google Drive. It's going to take me some time to do that. All right. And is there a link that you already gave us in a syllabus? Not yet. I'm going to be creating that. Thank you, Professor. Okay.